Let's get into a second part of a three-part series of videos based off of the book, The Philosophy of Fascism by Mario Palmieri. The first part dealt with fascism as a philosophy, fascism as a way of life. Part two will deal with fascism as a political and economic organization. All possibilities of the realization of democracy rest ultimately upon the implicit belief in the capacity of the common man to know what is good and beautiful and true, that is, upon a naive unbound faith in his wisdom. And because it has been generally assumed that wisdom can be taught, it was only natural to hope that in adequate time the common man would undoubtedly become the living embodiment of all intellectual and moral virtues. And finally, because men in general believe to be true what they only hope to be true, the gospel of democracy as this new utopia found immediate acceptance and widespread diffusion. The whole history of modern times may be characterized by the struggle, the temporary victory, and the final defeat to ensure the kingdom of democracy in human society when this society was not ready and is not and will perhaps never be to let the common man be our tributor of his own and his brother's life. But this phase of human history is drawing to a close if it has not already drawn to a close. You have to remember at this time they were pretty hopeful that they've seen the end of capitalistic democracies. More and more clearly and forcefully we are coming to realize that we were and are deceiving ourselves. That narrow limitations constitute the boundaries of the spiritual, intellectual, and moral life of the common man. That he is by nature endowed with instincts but not with wisdom and that no amount of learning, instruction, education can ever increase his human stature beyond the limits set to his possibilities at the very time of his birth. Fascism recognizes, therefore, at the outset that democracy cannot be realized and that whenever and wherever it has been tried, it has degenerated sooner or later into an oligarchy of tyrannical autocrats, be they military as of old or financial as in modern times. And that holds true today. I mean, we are completely run by an oligarchy of international finance and multinational corporations. As Mussolini said, 17th of November, 1922, we want to uplift the people materially and spiritually, but not because we think that number, mass, quantity may create some special types of civilization in the future. We leave this ideology to those who profess themselves to be priests of this mysterious religion. These words of Mussolini are the key to the twofold aspects of fascism characterized by its lack of faith in the masses and its great aim of uplifting their material and spiritual conditions. What shall the fascist state do then for the countless beings constituting the pulsating living masses of people? with their ambitions and their desires, their love and their hates, their dreams and their hopes? What shall the fascist state do for them and what can it expect from them in return? It is in the positing of such a question and in its answer where fascism differs most radically from any political and social system of modern times, because the whole outlook of fascism on the role played by the different individuals of a nation is based on a philosophical conception of the uttermost singularity and importance. Fascism resolutely rejects that so often and so vociferously repeated slogan that all men are created equal. Fascism holds instead that all men are created unequal in intellectual, spiritual, moral, and physical attributes. What is common to all men is their humanity. But just because of the fact that the supreme meaning of this common root overshadows the meaning of whatever differences might exist in those accessories of human personality which are taught, creative ability, artistic, artistic expression, and so forth. Just because of the fact that all men, whether they are intelligent or not, creators or thinkers or laborers, artists or artisans, are nevertheless only and simply human beings after all. Fascism holds 
that all the members of a nation must consider themselves to be nothing more than servants of one cause, giving correspondingly to the inborn possibilities the full measure of their devotion to the triumph of this cause. What mankind has lost thus with the loss of political democracy, it has gained with a revenge in this new conception of a spiritual democracy where the greatest and lowest have, in the eyes of the state, the same ultimate worth. The criticism heaped thus at fascism, when it has been confused with dictatorship, has no foundation because the two terms are not synonymous, because fascism is something more, something infinitely greater than dictatorship because the fascist peculiar form of political organization is nothing else but a tool necessary at present for the building up of a nation's life and because this tool may be used or discarded in turn as the occasion arises and the needs demand it without affecting in the least the essential truth of fascism if authoritarian rule in other words is temporarily a necessary element of fascism if liberalism must be discarded for a new form of social theory, if democracy is incompatible with the true political and social characteristics of mankind, it is nevertheless also true that fascism does not imply necessarily dictatorship, that liberalism may still evolve so as to accept as fundamental reality of life the duality between the possibilities inherent to man as individual and those inherent to man as a social being and abandon forever its utopian belief in man as master of the whole universe and that finally the new democracy may be enabled to select heroes for leaders, true heroes, not demagogue puppets, and become thus another form of fascism under a different name. The distrust of the parliaments, which only now have become general throughout the entire world, was voiced by F.T. Marinetti in Italy as early as 1910. The parliamentary system is almost everywhere a wasted form, he said. It gave us a few good results, created an illusionary participation of the majority in the government. I say illusionary because it is proved fact that people cannot and will never be represented by representatives, that they do not know how to select. The people, therefore, always remain outside the government. It's the fascist state. The humanistic principle of the liberal state, which was born out of a vague belief in the worth of the individual, had seen its best days and had degenerated into chaotic and meaningless practice. The democratic principle, which presupposes the inborn wisdom of the masses, the fundamental moral goodness and the unquestioned intellectual capacity of the people, had been thoroughly disproved by the actual facts in those countries where it had been most characteristically tried. Nothing else seemed left for mankind than the communist folly bringing the world suddenly back to the primitive state of society of ants or bees. Faced with this symptomatic decay of all political organizations, the first task of fascism became that of re-establishing the faith of mankind into the state as an ideal. The reason of being of the state is not to be found instead, according to fascism, in external causes like for instance, a social contract of its component parts, but it is to be found in the nature of the ethical entity summing up in itself the collective expression of a nation. Without the state, there is no nation. As the nation first rises to consciousness of itself in the state and through the state, it is instead the supreme characteristic of the fascist state, the capacity and the will to act, to legislate, and to command, the capacity, in other words, of operating as an ethical personality. This concept of the function that the state must fulfill in the world of man, and which represents, without doubt, one of the most original concepts of fascism, finds its most brief and explicit expression in the definition of the state fascist labor charter, the Magna Carta of fascism. To read this definition, means to read the opening of a new chapter in the development of human society. It means also to breathe again the air of idealism coming to vivify once more the life of man into an expression of spiritual energy. It means finally to prove the sense of elation and pride derived from the realization that it is yet possible for man to know and realize some of the highest truths of the spiritual world. 
and the quote he's speaking about from the fascist labor charter which also on this channel there is a video based off of the fascist labor charter uh, the quote being the Italian nation is an organism which has an aim a life a means of action superior both in element and power an element of time to the aims the life and the means of action of the individuals or groups of individuals who compose it. We find thus, in his first utterance on the subject, Mussolini says on November 16, 1922, It is not of definite programs that Italy is lacking. No. What is lacking to Italy are men and the will to apply those programs. The state represents today this firm and determined will. The definition of the state finds thus an always better expression as time goes on. But the supreme function of the fascist state, that of safeguarding and incarnating the idea, the essence of the will of the nation, is awaiting its true definition as yet. This definition is almost at the point of being defiantly uttered when Mussolini, speaking on the 8th of August 1924, says, The state sums up in itself not only political consciousness of the nation at the present time, but also what the nation is going to be in the future. The fascist state is, in other words, not only the social, political, and economic organization of the people of a nation, but it is also the outward manifestation of their moral and religious life, and as such is therefore an ethical state. In the words of Giovanni Gentile, we affirm our belief that the state is not a system of hindrances and external judicial controls from which men flee but an ethical being which, like the conscience of an individual, manifests its personality and achieves its historical growth in human society. Thus it is conscious of not being hedged in by special limits, but of being open, ready, and capable of expanding as a collective and yet individual will. The nation is that will, conscious of itself and of its own historical past, which, as we formulate it in our minds defines and delineates our nationality generating an end to be attained a mission to be realized for that will in case of need our lives are sacrificed for our lives are genuine worthy and endowed with the inconstitutable value only as they are spent in accomplishment of that mission the state's active and dynamic consciousness is a system of thought of ideas of interest to be satisfied and of morality to be realized. Hence the state is, as it ought to be, a teacher. It maintains and develops schools to promote this morality. In the school, the state comes to a consciousness of its real being. According to these views of fascist thinkers, the state is therefore no more a purely abstract political entity, but a concrete being whose growth, development, and progress follow laws upon their own, and the nation is, at the same time, the material substance and the spiritual essence of the state. The process of education implies thus primarily the formation and fostering of the national consciousness. The rise of fascism destroys forever thus that Gideon's knot of apparently insoluble social problems born from the clash of conflicting interests of individuals within the state. No individuals or group, political parties, cultural associations, economic unions, social classes are outside the state. Fascism is therefore opposed to socialism to which unity within the state as an amalgamation of classes into a single economic and ethical reality is unknown which sees in history nothing but class struggle. Fascism is likewise opposed to trade unionism as a class weapon but when brought within the state Fascism recognizes the real needs which gave rise to socialism and trade unionism, giving them due weight in the guild or corporative system in which divergent interests are coordinated and harmonized within the unity of the state. Grouped according to their several interests, individuals from classes, they form trade unions when organized according to their several economic activities. But first and foremost, they form the state which must never be considered as a mere matter of numbers and simply the sum of the individuals forming the majority. 
fascism is therefore opposed to that form of democracy which equates a nation to the majority, lowering it to the level of the largest number. But it is the purest form of democracy if the nation be considered as it should be from the point of view of quality rather than quantity. As an idea, the mightiest become the most ethical, the most coherent, the truest, expressing itself in a people as the conscious and will of the few, if not indeed of one, and ending to express itself in the conscious of the will of the mass, of the whole group ethically molded by natural and historical conditions into a nation advancing, as one conscious and one will along the same line of development and spiritual formation. The nation is not a race, nor a geographical defined region, but a people historically perpetrating itself, a multitude unified by an idea and imbued with the will to live, the will to power, self-consciousness, personality. Fascism, in short, is not only a lawgiver and founder of institutions, but an educator and promoter of spiritual life. Its aim at refashioning not only the forms of life, but their content, man, his character, and his faith, to achieve this purpose, it enforces discipline and uses authority, entering into the soul and ruling with undisputed sway. Therefore, it has chosen as its emblem the Lictorods, the symbol of unity, strength, and justice. The Constitution of the Fascist State In the Fascist State, the legislative power belongs both to the Parliament and to the King, who through his Secretary of State, exercises the legislative power by refusing to let any bill which he disapproves of receive parliamentary consideration. Now, of course, you have to remember, in uh, fascist Italy, it, it truly never was a finalized fascist revolution uh, like what happened in Germany. Uh, the king was still the final decision maker, which personally I think was a mistake. It should have been fully revolutionary and deposed the king right away. Furthermore, it is in the faculty of the executive power to emanate judicial norms without the immediate consent of the legislative branch of government, whenever the supreme good of the state may require it. This new power of the executive sets well-defined limits to the activity of the legislators, bringing this activity back to that true function of legislation, so often misinterpreted in the degeneration of the liberal democratic doctrines. And as this collaboration is realized in the best possible way, when during the discussion of each law, specialized knowledge is brought to bear on each specific problem, it becomes necessary that the Chamber of Deputies be transformed from a political congregation of heterogeneous individuals to a specialized homogeneous body of experts on the various aspects of life. So very technocratic on decisions, instead of having a bunch of lawyers and politicians you know, argue in the parliament about it, uh, have skilled and educated and well-versed people in whatever field the decision is being made, taking a part of the discussion of what laws are to be made or what actions are to be taken. The Chamber of Deputies becomes thus a vocational chamber whose 400 members are elected, are elected by list drawn up by the fascist Grand Council containing 1,000 names designated by the various vocational groups of the nation. In the fascist state, the ministers are responsible only to the premier, who in turn is responsible to the king alone and to no other. The king, in other words, not the people, is the true sovereign of the fascist state. Highly characteristic of this reform is therefore the place which fascism assigns to the premier, who is also the secretary of state. Now, this is Mussolini's role as well as head of government, inferior in authority only to the king, and invested with the dignity and the responsibility far superior to that of any other organ of the state. This authority conferred to the head of government is far from making of him what is commonly meant today by the word dictator. Time it was when a dictator was a person elected by the people and to whom the people delegated their authority for a determinate period of time only. A dictator was then a servant, not a master of the people. He worked in the interest of the people only and inasmuch as the people were then identified with the state. He worked in the interest of the state. The two poles of the fascist state are the people and the king. 
not the people and the head of the government. While the king personifies the sovereign authority of the state, authority which in itself sums up all powers, executive, legislative, and judiciary, the head of the government represents only the king in his relationship with the people. It is thus that in the fascist reform of the state, the king is still the only one who has the right to declare war or accept peace, the right of pardoning those condemned by the judiciary organs of the state, the right of stipulating in the name of the state treaties of alliance with other states, and finally the right to be outside and above all laws. The description of the fascist reform would not be complete without mentioning the part played by the, the Grand Council of the Fascist Party. This Grand Council is an absolutely new organ of government, a purely fascist creation, which finds no counterpart in the constitution of any other state. The Grand Council, being the voice of the only recognized political party of the nation, the Fascist Party, in the absence of a political chamber of deputies, is the only recognized political organ of the Fascist State. The Grand Council does not legislate nor pass judgment, neither enforces laws nor repeals them. What it does accomplish is something of a very elusive character. It maintains always alive the fascist tradition. Its more specific functions are the approval of the king's successor, the designation of the crown of the head of the government and of to the ministers, the choice of the names to be submitted to the various vocational groups for the election of their deputies, the discussion of all questions which may affect the constitution of the fascist state and the deliberation of all issues which may affect the life of the fascist party. In brief, the Grand Council is not the crown, not the people, not the government, not the party. It is simply the organ through which fascism will perpetrate itself in the Italian nation as long as there are Italians fit to become fascists. So in that segment he broke down the levers of power in the Italian fascist state. And once again, a common misconception was Mussolini was this complete dictator figure when actually the king served more as that. And once again, in my own opinion, it's, it was a bad idea. Mussolini and the fascists should have been more, and more revolutionary and ousted the king. And of course, there were people that wanted that within the fascist party. And maybe that would have come about in some parallel universe where World War II didn't happen. But we go on now, we go on to the corporative idea. Fascism, which is the very antithesis of individualism, stands as the nemesis of all economic doctrines and all economic practice of both capitalistic and the communistic system. Fascism holds that, one, the economic life of man cannot be abstracted and separated from the whole of his spiritual life. In the words of Mussolini, the economic man does not exist. Man is integral. He is political, economic, religious, saint, and warrior, all at the same time. Indeed, he is not simply just a stock share for the elite to trade and sell whenever it profits them to do so. Number two, the economic life of man is influenced, if not actually determined, by idealistic factors. Idealistic factors being the mission Paul Mary spoke about earlier. Whatever the unified goal of the people and country are, whatever they're working towards together to achieve these magnificent goals. The idealism of fascism, of third position ideology, is always fantastical. Three, true economic progress can derive only from the concerted effort of individuals who know how to sacrifice their personal egoism and ambition for the good of the whole. 4. Economic initiatives cannot be left to the arbitrary decisions of private individual interests. Yeah, it's insane to allow people who have no attachment or, or to allow individuals who have no attachment to the people to make economic decisions that's going to affect the whole country. Especially at the end of the day when these individuals who are involved in these corporations, who are the elites of these corporations, are only concerned with the bottom line. Profit. Fascism puts people before profit. 
Capitalism puts profit before people. Number five, open competition, if not wisely directed and restricted, actually destroys wealth instead of creating it. Six, the wealth of a community is something intangible, which cannot be identified with the sum of riches of single individuals. Number seven, the proper function of the state in the fascist system is that of supervising, regulating, and arbitrating the relationships of capital and labor, employers and employees, individuals and associations, private interests and national interests, which once again, just another misnomer promoted by typically capitalists and conservatives is that fascism was this full central planning, fully controlled, fully totalitarian economic system, which put everyone under the weight of a single dictator. Number eight, class war is avoidable and must be avoided. Class war is deleterious to the orderly and fruitful life of a nation. Therefore, it has no place in the fascist state. Number nine, more important than the production of wealth is its right distribution, which must benefit in the best possible way all the classes of the nation, hence the nation itself. And number 10, private wealth belongs not only to the individual, but in a symbolic sense to the state as well. Knowing that the social problem cannot be entirely solved by regulation of the reports between capital and labor, but must be solved also with regard to the general facts of production and distribution, fascism decrees that the productive forces of the nation cannot be any longer at the mercy of the individual's selfishness and greed, and must be brought instead under the supreme discipline of the state. Originated as an instrument of the war of classes, syndicalism attempted to organize the various categories of workers in syndical organizations, having no other goal than the protection of the material welfare of its own members. These organizations were devoted thus to the furthering of supremely particularized interest, ready to set themselves against each other and against the state itself, whenever those interests were menaced or conflicted with others. The problem which presented itself as an ominous menace upon the horizon of fascism at the outset of its very life in Italy was, therefore, to bring at once the phenomenon of syndicalism under the authority of the state, and successfully to transform its original aim of protecting the interests of the proletariat into protecting the interests of the whole nation. This could be accomplished only by enlarging the narrow form of the original syndicalist organizations into larger forms which would include all the citizens of the nation into an all-comprehensive national manifestation. This manifestation of the Italians of all classes, all professions, all trades, and of all creeds into the framework of one enormous and far-reaching organization, which has for its end the material welfare of the whole, is called national syndicalism. This national syndicalism represents the first attempt made to bring the egotistical claims of the individual under the discipline of the sovereign state. For the realization of an aim which transcends the welfare of the individual and identifies itself with the prosperity of the whole nation. To make this discipline possible and the sovereignty effective in practice as well as in theory, fascism had devised the corporations, an instrument of social life destined to exercise the most far-reaching influence upon the economic development of fascist states. Within the corporations, the interests of producers and consumers, employers and employees, individuals and associations are interlocked and integrated in a unique and univocal way, while all types of interests are brought under the aegis of the state. Finally, through these corporations, the state may at any time that it deems fit, or that the need requires, intervene within the economic life of the individual to let the supreme interest of the nation have precedence over his private particular interests, even to the point where his work, his savings, his whole fortune may need to be pledged, if absolutely necessary, sacrificed. The fascist state can be defined then as a state of syndical composition and corporative function. Through these corporations, the fascist state not only recognizes the specific interest of individuals, of classes and categories, 
also recognized by the liberal and democratic state, but in addition organizes them, submits them to the authority and discipline of the state, and makes of them the most appropriate instruments for the development of the economic life of the nation. Whoever thinks of fascist economy must think of it, therefore, as of something more than a new form of economics, because it is first of all, and above all, a translation of ethics into economics, an application of ethical principles to economic facts. Once the economic problem has been disposed of, there still remains to be solved the problem of a satisfactory human life. Economic security cannot be more than a gateway Economic security cannot be more than a gateway to the life of the spirit. Material welfare can never be exchanged or bartered for the welfare of the soul. The fascist doctrine avails itself of the economic principles of syndicalism and corporation, but considers them only as a tool. Its aim is not to establish a paradise of communism in which each man shall have equal share of all the good things of life, or the paradise of the individualism in which each man shall have all that he can get of all the good things of life and remain satisfied with them, but to establish a state of society where man, free of the struggle for existence, may devote his energies to a greater aim of concerning himself with those things which outlast the centuries and partake of the truth. Which has always been one of the most attractive aspects of fascism as far as I'm concerned and what makes me a fanatical believer in it. Let's go over that again. But to establish a state of society where man, free of the struggle for existence, free from the struggle of existence, why? Because uh, you're part of this corporative system. Uh, you're working, you have a job, you're contributing, uh, you're getting that back, you're having your nationalized health care, your nationalized education. You have your material comforts but more importantly so, may devote his energies to the greater aim of concerning himself with those things which outlast the centuries and partake of the truth. So now your energies, what you're working towards, is not just to make some company richer, sell more product to people, but partaking in these magnificent, fantastical ideas these concepts which outlast the centuries and partake of the truth, which is the deepest essence of what man should be trying to engage in in our short experience on this earth. But no, this Big Mac's important for us. Fascism denies the equation well-being equals happiness, which would make of men of mere animals, thinking only how they can satiate and fatten themselves, reducing them, therefore, to a vegetative existence, pure and simple. And if it is true that matter has been worshipped throughout a whole century, it is also true that it is a spirit which today has taken its place. And he's talking about what was going on in modern Italy. If it's true that matter has been worshipped like it is now, or it's all material worship today, uh, in his time, when there was this young revolution going on, it was spirit that had taken a place. As the old saying goes, man cannot live off bread and water alone. You need a cause. You need something deeper. Let's go deeper into the corporative system. Uh, the fascist regime must always avoid the corruption of the spirit by the letter. Avoid also materialistic aims which may overshadow the idealistic ones. Avoid, finally, the possibility of interest or ambitions of a few individuals prevailing over the general interest of the people. Mussolini. This syndicalist organization, generally thought of as a highly complicated structure, is in fact very simple. Employers and workers are grouped separately in professional and trade associations of the first grade, local syndicates. These local syndicates are grouped in turn in higher grade syndical associations called federations, each representing a single category or class of persons engaged in the same occupation. These federations, of a national character and therefore called national federations, are also linked together whenever they cover activities having some ground in common. 
This link is provided by a syndical association of a still higher grade called Confederation, which joins all the national federations of syndicates engaged in one of the four branches of activity, banking, industry, commerce, and agriculture. There are thus eight general confederations, four of employers and four of employees, engaged in the four main branches of national activity, and in addition, a ninth national confederation of all intellectual workers constituted by the association of all persons engaged in the arts and professions, where no distinction is made between employer and worker. The confederations are organs of semi-political nature, because they are empowered to represent the interest of their affiliated syndicates in all their relationships with the national government and are empowered by the state to supervise, control, and coordinate on behalf of the government the activities of the local syndicates in its provinces. So it sets up stages of accountability. The duties of the local syndicates are a. To stipulate collective labor contracts for the workers in the territory of his jurisdiction. B. Settle labor disputes. C. Organize social welfare services and professional training courses for its members. D. Appoint representatives to sit at boards or committees where the entire category should be represented. And once again, in, in the fascist uh, labor charter video, it goes into details uh, very similar to this. The duties of the national federations are a. Protect the interest of all categories represented in the favor of their economic and technical development. b. Examine and settle economic and social questions concerning each of the categories represented. c. Stipulate collective labor contracts between categories. d. Regulate economic relations between them. e. Supervise social welfare work and the technical and mental training of members, F. Promote the development and improvement of production, and G. Appoint representatives of the various categories to sit at corporations and other councils where such categories should be represented. Confederations have duties and functions very similar to those assigned to the national federations, but they cover a wider and deeper range of action, inasmuch as they are concerned with the general interest of all national federations represented by them. They represent thus the most important part of the entire edifice of fascist syndicalism. It is thus current practice of the fascist system that whenever disputes arise within a syndical organization that they are referred to their respective corporations and, if necessary, to the ministry of corporations for an effort at conciliation. Should the conciliation fail, the dispute is brought before the labor court which is nothing more than an ordinary court of appeal assisted by experts in the subject under dispute. So once again, levels and accountability. The employer does not have the last say. At present, there are 22 corporations in existence, composed of delegates from employers and employees in all national activities, together with ex-official members and technical experts. The activities of the 22 corporations are coordinated through the National Council of Corporations and subject to the supreme authority of the Ministry of Corporations. Let's see how their corporations are broke down here. The 22 corporations are eight corporations for cycles of production embracing agriculture, industry, and commerce. A corporation of cereals, corporations of fruit, vegetables, flowers, corporation of viticulture and wine, corporation of sugar, beet, and sugar, corporation of edible oil, corporation Corporation of Livestock and Fisheries, Corporations of Forestry, Lumber and Wood, and eight corporations of textiles. Eight corporations for cycles producing for cycles of production embracing industry and commerce. So Corporation of Metal and Engineering, Corporation of Chemical Trades, Corporation of Clothing Trades, Corporations of Printing, Publishing and Paper, Corporation of Building Trades and Housing, Corporation of Water, Gas and Electricity. Corporation of Mining and Quarrying, Corporation of Glassware and Pottery, six corporations covering occupations productive of services, Corporation of the Arts and Professions consuming four sections, Legal Professions, Medical Professions, Technical Professions, the Arts, Corporations of Inland Transports comprising four sections, 
railways, tramways, and the inland navigation transports by motor, traffic auxiliaries, communications by telephone, corporation of sea and air transports, corporation of hotel industry, corporation of credit and insurance, comprising three sections, bank, savings banks, and public institutions, insurance, and lastly, the corporation of entertainments. With the classification of the 22 corporations, the description of the syndical organization of the fascist state is finally complete. Looked at in its totality, this organization appears as a hierarchical arrangement which proceeds from the local syndicates through the national federations, the nine general confederations, and 22 corporations, the national council of corporations, and the ministry of corporations in a continuously ascending series of attributes, of attributes, duties, and powers, and in a continuously widening sphere of tasks and influence, duplicating in its economic order the greater social hierarchical arrangement of the fascist nation and the fascist state as a whole. And that brings us to the end of the economic section of this book. And thus the end of this video, which set out to explain some of the mentality and the functioning setup of fascist economics. All with the ideal of unifying, not erasing classes, not having classes at each other's throats, but unifying the classes in the direction of a greater destiny, a greater shared destiny. For further reading, The Philosophy of Fascism by Mario Palmari.